As we examine the nature of cells, we will begin by looking at traits that are found in all cells, regardless of what kind of an organism they are found in. First of all, every cell, whether it's a bacterium cell, whether it's the cells of one of our bodies, whether it's uh, a protist cell or an algal cell, whatever it is, there is something we call cytoplasm in it. Cyto means cell, so this is the plasma of the cell. Inside the cell membrane, we have basically water with all sorts of dissolved materials in it. The water's a little thick because it's got a lot of dissolved materials, but this thick water containing lots of dissolved materials is called cytoplasm. Every cell contains cytoplasm. And most of the time, the molecules that are in the cytoplasm move around by the process of diffusion, where low concentrations of that uh, molecule are found in one place in the cell, higher concentrations in others, and where that happens, there's an automatic tendency, because of the second law of thermodynamics, for this, the molecules in the high density areas to just automatically move to places of low density. This is how most of the molecules in a cell move from one place to another. A second characteristic of all cells is the cell membrane. Uh, this is a membrane surrounding the cell that, uh, again, is a mounting position for uh, the met metabolic molecules that are used in the cell. And it's a place for the insertion of a number of other things. With uh, most of the cells, it's a phospholipid, phospholipid bilayer we've re referred to before. It surrounds the cell. This particular bilayer, as I've already said, lets certain molecules through, just the really small things through, that don't have charges. So water can get through, doesn't have enough charge that it, that it can't get through. Carbon dioxide, oxygen, these are things that are extremely small molecules. They can go back and forth through the membrane without any difficulty. They don't, they're not impeded. Anything larger than those really small molecules or anything with an electrical charge cannot get through the membrane of the cell. But also embedded in the membrane of the cell are a number of proteins again, shape molecules that are used for various and sundry functions by the cell. For example, we have uh, some proteins that are, uh, that are stuck in the membrane of the cell and reach out into the world outside the cell and detect, for single-celled organisms, food particles out there. Uh, other uh, proteins are stuck in the uh, membrane of the cell, reach out and touch nearby cells in our body, for example, and connect to other cells. So you can connect muscle cells to muscle cells so that they can function together. Uh, there are also uh, membrane uh, receptor proteins that their purpose is to receive certain molecules that come flying through the space outside the cell, land there, and they will tell the cell that these things are out there. Sometimes those are messages from the larger body for the cell to understand. And then there are, uh, there are also doors. Uh, when you want certain kinds of uh, molecules into the cell, but they're too large to go through the membrane, uh, there are membrane proteins that let those things in. And there's a host of other things. There's a lot of proteins that are actually stuck in the cell membrane. The third characteristic that's found in all cells, regardless of what kind of cell it is, what kind of organism it is, is the cytoskeleton. Again, cyto means cell, skeleton, you get the concept that it's uh, like bones inside the cell, and that's what it is. It is a structure, uh, an interlocking structure of proteins inside the cell that gives one, the cell, it's, uh, its shape. Uh, two, it determines where things inside the cell are to be located, and it's used for locomotion. The kinds of proteins that are found in the cytoskeleton include all sorts of different shaped and functioned uh, uh, filaments. There's some fine filaments, kind of analogous to ropes. There are some tubular-shaped filaments, kind of analogous to pillars. 
there are twisted elements that are kind of more like cables. And these fulfill these kind of functions in the cell. They might uh, uh, go from one side of the cell to another to make the cell fat. Or they might pull the cell in to make it hot dog shaped or they might make the cell long, cylindrical shaped. These, so the cytoskeleton can give the cell its shape. They can also position things inside the cell into the proper locations. Uh, they can also move things around in the cell. You can lasso things and pull them from one end of the cell to the other. Uh, they also function as roads in the cell. Certain molecules move other molecules from one end of the cell to the other, and they follow the roads of the cytoskeleton from one end of the cell to the other. And finally, the cytoskeleton sticks out of the cell, in many cases, and is used to move the cell. So if you stick out of the cell with a long tail that you can spin or whip, you can move the cell with this tail. Or you can send out of the cell tiny little ores that you can use to propel the cell through water. Or in some cases, the cytoskeleton can be used to move the cell even though the cytoskeleton is entirely within the cell. For example, the cytoskeleton can move and change the shape of the cell and allow, for example, an amoeba cell to to reach out, grab onto a substrate, and then pull the rest of the cell in that direction. The cytoskeleton, though, fulfills all these functions, giving the cell shape, giving the cell uh, components positions, moving things around in the cell, and even moving the cell itself. These are three characteristics that are found in all cells, whether it's bacteria, or the cells of our bodies, or the cells of animals or plants or algae. Now we move to a smaller grouping, namely all the eukaryotic cells. So all we've done now is we set aside the bacteria. We're no longer considering the bacteria. We're now looking at all of the second class of organismal cells, those that are a little bit bigger than bacteria, about 10 times the size or more than bacteria. They have true bodies or membranes within the cell. The cell is too large to support all of its metabolism from uh, the outer membrane. They need membranes inside the cell. So they have these organelles made of membranes inside the cell, and therefore they're called eukaryotic. EU, U means true. Carrion is referring to a body. So these are cells with true bodies inside the cell. They have organelles, or small organs, within the cell itself. The, these would be cells in everything but bacteria. So they would be algae, even the single-celled algae, protists, even the single-celled protists, all the fungi, all the animals, all the plants, all of those organisms, everything but bacteria, have eukaryotic cells. And all eukaryotic cells have in them, first of all, a nucleus. In this particular diagram, it's showing up as that red-purple uh, structure there in the middle of the cell. Very often, the nucleus is a very large structure, very close, usually, to a sphere in, in shape. Uh, and uh, the nucleus has several uh, characteristics and one function. It stores and protects the DNA of the cell. You have already said that according to cell theory, every organism has DNA that carries the genetic material of the cell. Well, that DNA is stored in the nucleus of a cell. So it's not outside of cells, it's inside cells. More specifically, DNA is found inside the nucleus. And this is a place where the DNA is kept secure. And the analogy here might be you're building a building and you've created uh, drawings for the building. You've got architectural drawings for the building. And uh, you've designed everything in the building, but you now want to build it. 
what you don't want to do is take these original architectural drawings and send them out in the field where people are using uh, cement or plaster and they might drop water on it, they might stain it, they might destroy it. You don't want the original drawings or designs to be damaged by sending them out in the field to be damaged. So what you do is you have a particular location where you store all your ar ar architectural drawings and you, when you need the drawings to put in the electricity or whatever, you take them out, photocopy them, put the originals back in your storage cabinet, and send the copies out into the field to be used. You don't mind if the copies get destroyed because you all get, always got the originals you can make more copies from. Well, the DNA of uh, organisms is kind of similar to that. In the nucleus of the cell, we have the DNA stored. We don't take the DNA out of the nucleus to where we build things with the DNA. Instead, inside the nucleus, we copy the DNA or sections of the DNA that we want to use and take the copies out of the nucleus and we build the uh, things we want to build outside the nucleus. So it's very much like a very secure file cabinet or safe where we protect our DNA. The nucleus has, a, uh, has several interesting features. There's a nucleolus very often, or sometimes nucleoli, more than one nucleo nucleolus. The nucleolus is a place that makes what are called ribosomes. Now, ribosomes are actually things that are used outside the nucleus, but the components of the ribosomes are actually made inside the nucleus. There's a big component and a little component that makes up a ribosome. When you put the big and little component together, it makes a machine that's kind of similar to, analogous to a sewing machine. It'll take the information from the DNA, the copy that you made of the DNA, take it in one side of the sewing machine, and out comes out the other side of the sewing machine a string of nucleotides that'll be made into a protein. So it is a type of uh, machinery that builds proteins. The proteins are built outside the nucleus, but the ribosome itself is built inside the nucleus, and then the pieces are brought outside the nucleus and put together in the area outside the nucleus. The nucleus is surrounded by a double membrane. Now remember, a single membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. It's got the, the, the phospholipids with their feet together, and each layer is a phospholipid bilayer. The nucleus is, is surrounded by a double membrane. So technically that would be four phospholipid layers that are used to surround the nucleus. And the reason that there is a double layer is so that you can occasionally have these pores or large holes in the outside of the nucleus. These are places where the double layer can be folded in and allow you to create a very large hole going from the inside of the nucleus to the outside. Why do you need a large hole? Because the copies that you make of the DNA are on very large molecules. They need very large holes to run through in order to allow those copies to, be, uh, to, to get from the nucleus into the cytoplasm outside the nucleus. Secondly, those big pieces of the ribosome, even though the ribosome is made in two pieces, each of those pieces is a very large molecule, and it requires a very large hole to, for, those, for those molecules to get out of the nucleus. So a characteristic of the nucleus, if you're to see it under a microscope or a powerful enough microscope to see this, is it's got a double membrane around it with large holes or pores in it for the, for, to allow the copies from the DNA and the ribosome components to go in and out of the nucleus. A second trait of all eukaryotic cells is what we call the endomembrane system. Endo refers to inside. This is a membrane system inside the cell. And it is a system. It's composed of a number of different components in the, in the cell and uh, makes up most of the 
uh, the items that are inside the cell but outside the nucleus. First of all, if you start from the nucleus and work out away from the nucleus, you encounter something called the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, actually, endo means interior or inside. Plasmic refers to that plasma membrane. So the endoplasmic reticulum is part of the endomembrane system. You could say endoplasm, plasma system. The endoplasmic reticulum, reticulum refers to reticulated would be folded over against itself. Basically, the endoplasmic reticulum, sometimes shortened ER, the ER is like one big bag. It's a bag with an awful lot of surface area. It's a huge membrane with a huge amount of surface area that is very carefully folded. So it's collapsed and folded in such a way that if you made your way through it, it kind of looks like if you cross-sectioned it, you're looking through a maze. You, you go into this, the thing and go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and make your way through the endomembrane system, through the endoplasmic reticulum, from the nucleus all the way out towards the outside of the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum's purpose is really to create a huge amount of surface area because stuck into the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum are these ribosomes that I was referring to before. These little sewing machine-like things are stuck into the, uh, out the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum and, and proteins are made in these ribosomes. So as you move out from the nucleus, you've got a membrane with lots of ribosomes on it. They try to show it here by little dots on the membrane. Actually, under a microscope, the ribosomes are so large, they kind of look like uh, jewels or seeds stuck in the walls of the endoplasmic reticulum, giving it a rough appearance, a studded appearance. And so the first part of the endoplasmic reticulum is often called the rough endoplasmic reticulum or the rough ER. It's in the rough ER, closest to the nucleus, where we build our proteins, or we at least begin to build our proteins, and this is where the ribosomes are located. As we move outward, back and forth through the uh, maze of the endoplasmic reticulum, we get to a portion of the reticulum illustrated here in, in kind of a, a different kind of maze shape that, is, that doesn't have ribosomes, and it's, so it's smooth-walled. So we often just call it smooth endoplasmic reticulum, smooth ER. It's in this portion of the endoplasmic reticulum where, or the ER, where we build our lipids. The cell builds proteins in the rough ER and lipids in the smooth ER. And by the way, I'll say it here, the cell obviously has to make a bunch of carbohydrates, but we don't know where a lot of the carbohydrates are made. It's part of the mysteries uh, of biology that we still haven't solved. Now, once we've made our way, once uh, fluid has made its way through the endoplasmic reticulum from the nucleus, it has accumulated a whole bunch of things that are going to be made into, uh, into uh, proteins. It, it's accumulated a whole bunch of lipids. And now we need to get these proteins and lipids out of the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER, and take them to wherever they're supposed to go in the cell. But there's one significant thing that's still needed for all of these things. We still need to put an address label on the uh, proteins to indicate where the protein's supposed to go in the cell. We've produced all sorts of different kinds of proteins, but some of them are going to go into the cell wall, uh, the cell uh, plasma membrane. Some are going to go back into the nucleus. Some are going to go into other organelles. Some are going to be kicked out of the cell altogether. So we have to, with each protein and with each lipid, we have to put instructions to the cell on where that particular molecule is to go. So we've got to get it out of the ER and move it someplace. And we do this by the production of what are called vesicles. Say when you get out to the edge of the ER, you get out to the, you, you're, you're now stuck inside the big bag of the ER and you need to get out. 
So let's say we're talking about this, uh, uh, you've got the membrane of the ER, you've got the uh, molecules that you want to take out of the ER here. This membrane, what it begins to do is it begins to uh, fold outward and causing the molecules to go into that fold. So there's a dip in the, in the thing. And because it's a plasma membrane and flexible, it can go create a, uh, a, a circular object that actually pinches off and leaves the ER carrying a bunch of molecules in the process. So a, this is called a vesicle. It's a circular uh, spherical. Uh, piece of membrane that carries a whole bunch of molecules. It's like a mass transit system carrying thousands, millions of molecules out of the ER. These vesicles from the ER mainly go over to another uh, organelle in the endomembrane system known as the, uh, the Golgi body. And that's where we're sending it. It's in the Golgi body where in fact these molecules are giving shipping labels uh, to, to know where they're supposed to go in the, in the cell. So the vesicles float through the cell, through the cytoplasm of the cell, and approach the membrane of the Golgi body. The Golgi body is like the ER, also a big sac with lots of surface area that's folded or reticulated into a, a series of what looks like folded sacs, but it's actually one sac with many, uh, many chambers in it. And the vesicle approaches and fuses with the membrane of the Golgi body in the reverse way in which it left the ER. So it approaches the membrane fuses with the membrane of the Golgi body and ultimately opens the vessel, vesicle out into the interior of the Golgi body, dumping the molecules in there. And it's in then the Golgi body that uh, we, can we can put the shipping labels on the lipids and the proteins to know where they go. And by the way, most of the shipping labels are themselves carbohydrates. And once they're, they're labeled and ready to go out from there, a vesicle le will collect all of the molecules with the same shipping label and create a, a, a vesicle that leaves the Golgi body and then goes in the proper location, dumping those things out in the proper location. For example, let's say the shipping label says this goes into the nucleus then what happens is the vesicle will move over to the nucleus, fuse with the membrane of the nucleus, dumping the molecules into the nucleus. Or the shipping label might say, hey, this is going to go outside the cell, in which case the vesicle will move to the outside membrane of the cell, fuse with the outside membrane of the cell, and dump the molecules outside the cell. Or it can dump it into any one of the other um, organelles of the cell. A third uh, organelle or type of organelle in any eukaryotic cell is, in fact, a mitochondrion. Uh, plural is mitochondria. In this representation, there's three of them. Some cells have hundreds, even thousands of mitochondria. A uh, few cells might just have one or two. The mitochondrion is a very special organelle that's made of two membranes. So it's a double membrane in one sense similar to the nucleus. But in this case, they're, they're not fused together in such ways to produce holes to the outside. There's one membrane on the outside, which gives the mitochondrion sort of a kidney bean, bean shape. And there's a membrane on the inside, which is folded and convoluted, giving lots of surface area. The purpose of the mitochondria is the process of respiration. We're going to devote uh, part of a chapter to come on what respiration is, but basically what that is is breaking down energy containing molecules to release energy so that the cell has energy to do the work it needs to do. Kind of analogous to a, uh, a power uh, company, uh, maybe a coal burning electric plant. You burn your coal and that plant produces electricity. The electricity goes out and is used 
to do any number of things you want to do in a home, the uh, energy containing molecules such as monosaccharide sugars are brought into the mitochondrion, break, broken up, the energy is released, put into ATP, kind of like electricity. The ATP is released into the cell so the cell can do whatever it needs energy for. So at this point, we have looked at three characteristics of all cells, the cytoplasm, the cytomembrane, the exterior membrane, and the cytoskeleton. That's in every single cell in the, the known to, to life. Then we've got three uh, organelles that are found in eukaryotic cells. It would be the nucleus, the endomembrane system, and the mitochondria, or mito individual mitochondrions. Uh, and now, in the next session, we're going to look at some specialized features found in some cells.